get down to the basics and kind of try to understand what do you mean when you say customer value? And the whole book is based on that. So could you just give us an idea perhaps? Absolutely. I think it's very important to get the brass tacks right. You know, these are a lot of words get thrown around innovation, strategy, you know, uh, customer value, customer needs. And sometimes it can be very confusing. There's so many uh, words to describe something. So let's get some basics uh, right. The customer needs is basically a construct from motivational theory. Motivational theorists are usually concerned with a very uh, simple question. What causes human behavior? So uh, the idea of needs traces itself to a motivational psychologist called Henry Murray from the 1930s. Many of you may be familiar with Abraham Maslow. He, he developed this theory of hierarchy of needs in the 1940s. And Henry Murray, basically the idea was all of us are born with certain needs and we are constantly trying to meet those needs. So you discover needs, okay, but the, but the question of value arises when you want to know how well those needs are being met. Number two, how important is it for you at this point in time? So value is constantly being created. Needs are being discovered. It's like an onion, you're just peeling off the layers, right? So you'll never come across the phrase needs creation. You would come across the phrase, phrase value creation. That's a space that marketers are constantly uh, trying to do. So there are two variables that you actually are uh, seized off. Number one is how important is your product or service uh, to the customer and how well are they addressing, meeting the needs of the customer. So value is how well your needs are being met and how important is it for you. So marketers are constantly playing around with these two variables. So if health is not important for you right now and I'm providing a product or service in the, the, that addresses that particular need, I will try my best to move it up the, your priority list. When I do that, your antennas are up. Okay. So that's what marketers are constantly see. Right. So it's interesting that you speak about marketing and customer value of course and you've pun penned a good book on that so let me ask you this what was the genesis what did you draw upon to particularly pen this book uh, the book is basically the second book of mine my first book got uh, published in 2018 again through rupa it was titled unmet needs of entrepreneurship why entrepreneurs do what they do the second book is, in a way, an extension of the first book because it asked, the, the basic question is, why do customers buy or use your product or service? What will motivate them to do it? And these two ideas actually come not from business. I was motivated by looking at my, the work that my wife does. She's a counselor. And she works with parents and children in the parenting domain. And she's been doing this for the last 14, 15 years. And I realized that the, the way she was using the constrict of needs to build the connection, what in marketing it has become all the, you know, empathize and, you know, you go to design thinking, the first stage is empathize, etc. The most of even behavioral economics, all of those, Kahneman and Tversky, all of them are psychologists, right? So if you, if you look at Theodore Levitt, marketing myopia, it traces back to psychology. Basically, we are dealing with how people think and behave. So uh, my, uh, the genesis of this book actually comes from counseling and therapy, where the idea of needs was being very effectively used. I saw my wife using it to build a connection and empathy and compassion with your customers, with your patients. Right? So, so that's the genesis. So I just built on that and I was looking at how you can apply it to business. So uh, there are quite a few writers here. So they would like to kind of understand how much time did you take to write this book? Was it a trouble for you? Uh, this was basically during the COVID time, like Professor uh, Raghunathan also mentioned, when my, uh, you know, the time that I had during COVID probably triggered me to, you know, start applying my mind on this topic. But uh, trust me, uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a writer like uh, Professor Raghunathan. He knows what goes into it. But for someone like me, I'm not an academic nor a researcher. It's kind of hard. You know, I started with uh, posting a couple of my first book was the same idea. I posted a couple of my thoughts on LinkedIn. 
not very active. I just posted it. Some people said, hey, why don't you think of writing a book? Then I realized, right, you know, writing a one-page article on LinkedIn is very different from <laughs> writing a book. So, uh, so uh, that was a hard journey. In between, I almost you had the writer's block, and I said, hey, forget it. And then I uh, got some nice compliments from uh, 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 a leading academic from the Harvard Business School. And, and he kind of nudged me, uh, like Professor Raghunathan says, he, he also nudged me. And um, he said, these are interesting ideas. Uh, I'm looking forward to more of such ideas. So I just put them together. And uh, subsequently, he actually took a lot of interest. He wanted me to send the whole manuscript. And he, he was very sweet in giving compliments. He said it extends some of the stuff that he does in HP in, in Harvard Business School. And he's been teaching value creation for more than 10, 15 years. So that for me was a, was a nice compliment. So uh, I guess you would have forgotten my name by now. But that apart, uh, that was a nice compliment that triggered me to actually go on this path and see if I could get put my ideas together and, and come out of the book. Uh, off camera, of course, we were having a chat on what went into the book. So could you tell us what kind of research that you did and uh, what was the kind of work that you put in to write the book, of course? Writing a book is you need to chunk it down. You know, uh, any, any author will tell you that you know you need to chunk down the book writing process. You start with the TOC first, so you structure your thoughts around what you have to communicate and how you need to communicate it. And and it uh, because this is a non-fiction, I was actually uh, um, you know it, 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 it I had butterflies in my stomach because I was actually getting into the domain of researchers and academicians. I'm not an academic nor a researcher. But then I realized I can lean on my 20 years of entrepreneurial experience to basically these are perspectives. You know, these are perspectives in terms of how you look at the world, how you look at customers, how you look at business. So uh, for, for me, it took me around a year and a half, a uh, lot of reading, research, HBRs, and whatever was there in the public domain, I tried to consume that to understand if there are other areas which whether what I'm writing is not totally misaligned to what is already there in academia, you know, someone shouldn't say, look, this guy is going on off track on something else. So I had to ensure that it was somehow aligned to some of the existing ideas in this uh, domain. It's interesting because a lot of uh, testimonials have come in from places that usually don't come in. So how did that happen? Any ideas? Uh, so basically, you know, when, when it comes to you, you obviously seek testimonials when you're not so well known and, and uh, you want to uh, reach out to people who, who can endorse your uh, thinking and what goes inside the book. So I was thankfully, uh, I got some good endorsements from both academics uh, globally and also from CXO level thought leaders of uh, companies uh, across domains, whether it's Marico, Coca-Cola, Perfetti, many a MasterCard, so many of them. So, so they kind of endorsed the book, they were kind enough uh, and somewhere some obviously took more interest than uh, what one would usually show interest in. So, so, uh, but testimonials is something that you'd have to reach out and get endorsements. Right. So, one of the things that you've highlighted in your book is the idea of co-creation. All right. So, and you have uh, really, really underlined that. What is the, could you tell us, tell the audience, how, what is the need of co-creation and uh, what are the benefits of it? Co-creation is a terminology that's actually, uh, you know, it's caught the attention of a lot of people in the last 15 years. And it's not something new. We, we, we have been doing all the time. But by, by, but by, you know, what management gurus and academics and researchers do is they come out with phrases. When you come out with phrases, you basi basically shift your attention to, to a particular point of view and the way you think around that particular topic. So co-creation is something where in B2B especially, you know, when you have companies that co-create solutions along with their customers, it can produce value for both the customer and uh, the supplier. Uh, I can give you an example of LSI Logic. It's a company that's actually famous in ASIC and EDA design. ASIC is basically, you know, uh, specialized uh, chips for uh, application specific ICs. It's a small market, a 15 billion m uh, market as of 2019, but they disrupted that market. Uh, the economies of scale didn't, uh, it was a problem for people who are looking at custom chips. It was very expensive and Intel wouldn't be interested. So they stepped in and uh, how did they do it? What they did was the, the design 
and development and conceptualization of the chip, everything was passed on to the customer. The earlier LSA was doing it, they said, look, this is something you guys can do it at your own pace. So I, I reduce my cost because I don't have to hire people. I am able to give the design software to my customers who will build as per their requirements and give it to me. I do the fab, right? So uh, LSA was able to, LSI was able to disrupt uh, by co-creating solutions. And that's one example that's at uh, the, the top of my mind. But it, it, the co-creation part is kind of difficult. It's nice on paper. It, it, there's a lot of trust issue. There's a lot of other issues uh, related to co-creation. For every story, uh, uh, successful story in co-creation, you'll have so many stories that actually have failed. Okay, so, but yeah, that, that's one way to actually discover and create value. One of the topics that is interesting and very relevant in today's times for businesses is customer loyalty. All right, in this age of e-commerce and uh, so many websites, how do you maintain and how do you kind of bring the customer in for the long run? I wish I had an answer, but let me tell you, it's very hard. Especially if you're going to buy a product, same product, if you, that's listed on Amazon and, and, and elsewhere and you get a 20% discount, you are going to be drawn towards buying that product from Amazon, right? So it becomes pretty hard when you're just competing on price. So uh, as we all know, one of the strategies, business strategies that uh, for leadership is differentiation and cost leadership focus, etc. But on, on differentiation, the thing is, how do you create the perception of value for a customer? Now, here I wanted to draw your attention to something that you might have a satisfied customer, but the customer need not be loyal to you, even if they are satisfied. So one of the uh, factors that can actually contribute to loyalty is trust. So how, when you have to buy a flat from, say, apartment or property from Tata's, there's a reason you go to Tata's, because there is a trust element. You know that Tata's care for you. You know, there's something wrong also, something the building collapses, you would ensure that you, you'd still be protected. So trust is of two types. You know, you have credibility trust, you have benevolent trust. Credibility trust is something that most anyone in business is constantly working at. So am I, am I delivering on what I have promised to my customer? Right? Is it on time? Am I uh, all the deliverables as per my promise, etc., etc.? But increasingly, benevolent trust has become extremely important. Customer, it's not all about I, me, myself, and my profits. It's also about where is you, where is the customer footprint in what I'm actually doing. So if, if the perception for the customer is that you're a benevolent supplier who's also interested in my welfare, it increases the perception of value for, for the customer. So benevolent trust is something that most, uh, most suppliers are seized with. Uh, how do I develop the benevolent quotient? Now, nowadays, you know, it comes out in so many other different forms. So the messaging is very similar. Yeah, industry 5.0. You talk about sustainability, you talk about climate change. Basically, you're talking about uh, how benevolent are you as a supplier? Are you only thinking about your profits or are you also concerned about me? My second la last question would be, if time allows me, my last. So I would like to ask you, what are the key takeaways that the readers will walk away with when it comes to your book? Like I said, the book addresses two very fundamental questions. Where does customer value reside and how to find it? So I have, I have provided a very simple framework, uh, which will allow you to implement and execute these ideas in a practical way in your own organizations. So what, what could happen is uh, uh, you will be able to build a team with, which develops the innovation mindset, the mindset of collaboration and creativity and ideation. So if you want to do all of that, it's a good idea to have a diffusible tool. My book ends with the tool. At the end of the day, you read a book, you say, hey, this is all nice. So what do I do next? It's a nice read, but what do I do? So from a practitioner's point of view, I have also provided a tool. I, I also have my own online course and on my own LMS. So that allows you to think in a structured fashion and diffuse the ideas across an organization, 
have constant what I refer to as value storming exercises where ideas are focused on customer value. So you are constantly having conversations about what is it that the customer truly wants, right? And how do I discover it? Right. So those were some great responses. I would like to open the floor to whatever questions our audience might have. Anyone wants to ask any questions? Yep. The gentleman there. So you're talking about uh, customer value and uh, tools to grow business. Uh, but uh, hitherto, we have been seeing that uh, most of these uh, European and Western countries, they fail to give state-of-the-art technology to India. Just a small example, GM has uh, closed their shop uh, in India, but they could have brought out that Chevrolet Volt, uh, an EV vehicle, and tried to market it, but they didn't do it. And even Nissan Leaf, uh, for that matter, which is the largest EV uh, seller, See, these are things which are happening. Why? Uh, what is your take on that? Uh, let me is it Indians are not all that uh, this thing for uh, uh, buying or something? Okay, let like me. That. I think there's a very interesting question that you ask, and and immediately top of mind recall, I have a couple of examples that will illustrate the the kind of challenges that one faces. It's not about technology, and let me give you a couple of quick examples uh, to illustrate the point. You know, Harley Davidson. You know, it's a, a phenomenal bike, great on technology, and very popular in the US. And after 10 years, they shut shop in the last September, I think September 2021, after being in India for 10 years. In 10 years, they sold only 27,000 units. And it's not about technology. Technology is phenomenal. The problem is not getting the customer right. Who's going to pay for it? Their, their, uh, their bike costs... It's a high bore vehicle, 450 cc and above. 90% of the market in India is 150 cc. And you, they sold only 27,000 units in the last 10 years. Harley Davidson sold 60,000 units in three months during COVID in the US. Now, this is not about a technology problem. It's more to do with understanding customers. Uh, one is the pricing part. Okay, you still might have a segment, but number two is Harley-Davidson in the U.S. is very popular because of the roadways. They have fantastic roadways. People go on long distance drives in Harley-Davidson. In India, it is not suited to the Indian context. So if you get your context wrong, at some point in time, you're just delaying the demise of your product or service. Uh, from Going from uh, J.P. Nagar to Lal Bagh, intra-city rides, I don't require a Harley-Davidson to do that and pay for a four and four and a half lakhs. So the point that I'm making is technology is not the issue. I'll give you one more example. I hope time permits. Is Iridium. In the late 90s, I'm not sure if you're uh, uh, familiar with this, Motorola introduced uh, this fantastic phenomenal idea of uh, having 66 satellites launched. You know, the whole idea was they said, why are we having telecom towers on land-based systems? It's so expensive, cabling and installing these towers. Why don't we just have satellites that not only cover land-based systems, but also sea-based systems and air-based systems? Phenomenal idea, absolutely brilliant minds working on it, PhDs and all kinds of engineers, researchers. Single largest uh, bankruptcy, startup bankruptcy in India in American business history, five billion dollars. In one, after one year, they shut shop. They were looking at selling half a million handsets, they sold only 10,000. Within a year, they shut shop. Now, if you ask yourself the question, is it about technology? No. Some of the best minds, most brilliant people, a lot of money, it failed. Why did it fail? Two simple questions. They didn't think about the customer. See, the, the handset costed something between $3,000 to $5,000, or $5,000, $6,000. $5, the talk time, I'm talking about late 90s, Three to five dollars per minute. It didn't resonate with customers. The price point is not okay. Clunky handsets, the form factors are not okay. So you miss the customers outside the uh, your your whole uh, product and service. You're not taught about the customer and what the customer can afford to pay. 
So within a year, it just failed. So coming back to the point, you had given a couple of examples. It's not always about technology, but if you don't understand your customers right, at some point in time, you wind up. Any other question? <coughs> yep. uh, hi, sir. Good evening. I'm here. Yeah, please. Uh, so talking about the Harley Davidson example which you gave, how do you think after implementing the product in the market which they had not tested, how do you think they can change and meet the customer demands? See, that, that's uh, up to how HD wants to look at the whole thing, right? So they have a product. Now, I can keep going on uh, with some more examples, but I think time constraints. But Harley Davidson introduced a high bore vehicle, 450cc. Just ask yourself if it actually uses 450cc vehicles. Unless you want to go probably on a highway, there's a fantastic highway, and you go and ride on a, you can't, you can't even show off with a 450cc vehicle, right? So if you don't get the basics right in terms of who's your customer audience, who are you building your product for, who's going to pay for it, how much will they pay for it, then if you, those basic questions were really not perhaps thought through. The context in use the uh, vehicle, uh, somewhere it's not going to be aligned to, uh, you know, the customer's requirements. And it may, it's bound to fail sometime. Thank you. Sir. Right. That was uh, Mr. S. Parthasarthi setting the context of customer value. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you.